Number 98. For each of the following compounds, state whether it is ionic or covalent. And if it is ionic, write the symbols for the ions involved. Okay, so this one is going to be jam-packed with new information. We did a very similar question in number 97. So if you're on the playlist, you can just hit the back button if you want more practice. So let's get down to it. So remember, guys, that ionic compounds are always going to be a metal plus a nonmetal. And that's one type of ionic uh, compound. So I'm just going to put a one here. However, there's another one. So there's only one other exception. Well, there's one exception that you can have an ionic compound if you don't see a metal. And what the other exception is, is if you have two polyatomic ions coming together. So you might say, well, what are polyatomic ions, right? And how am I going to know what they are? Enter in the chart that I put down for you guys on the bottom left-hand uh, corner, common polyatomic ions. There's basically three things that you have to memorize for each polyatomic ion. You have to memorize the name of them, all right? And this will come in not handy, not for these questions and not for this chapter, but chapter four, all right? So we need to know the name. You need to know the elements that are involved in each polyatomic ion, and you need to know the charges. So those are the three things that it basically breaks down to. So for example, ammonium is always NH4. So those are the elements. There's one nitrogen, there's four hydrogens in every ammonium ion, and the charge of ammonium is always a plus one. That's the three things that you have to remember. The name, the elements involved, and the charge. And the charge will never change. So whatever the charges are that you see here that you're going to memorize, they'll never, ever, ever change. So that's a, that's a good thing. We don't want exceptions, all right? So this is basically set in stone. So just take some time, memorize them, because we will come back to them in the next chapter. I promise you that, all right? The next step that we need to learn is to how to decipher the periodic table by the individual elements and what their ions would be. So that basically goes by an oxidation, oxidation state trend. So we should know our oxidation states for our main group elements. And our main group elements, remember, are group 1 and 2, and then 13 all the way to 18. So the trend goes like this. Group 1 is always a plus 1 charge when these um, atoms bind. Group two will always be a plus two, which means that it will lose two electrons when it binds with it to, make, to, you know, to form a compound. And then this would be plus three and plus four. Then you're on the flip side. Now, why are these charges like this? Because you always want to get to be a noble gas. All right. So noble gases are like, you know, the gods of the elements, right? All the elements basically want to be like the noble gases. They want to have basically the same kind of electron configuration as them. So noble gases are like, well, we're all high and mighty, so we don't have to lose or gain any electrons, so their charge will always be zero. And then we start with the negatives. So group 17 would be a minus one, because remember, minus actually means gain in chemistry. And these elements can just gain one electron to become the noble gas. Group 16 could be a negative 2 because, like oxygen, they can gain two electrons to become a noble gas. And then the same thing with nitrogen, the whole nitrogen group, so that's a minus 3. And then finally you meet in the middle. This is actually a plus or a minus 4, depending on what the other element is. So we need to memorize that as well. It's a pretty simple chart, which will help you out greatly. Okay, so let's start. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write the elements on the right-hand side, and then when um, we're finished, I'll just erase and then rewrite. You'll see. So KClO4. First, got to figure out if it's ionic or covalent. Well, I automatically see that I have K, which is potassium. And K is right here. Oh, okay, well, K is a metal. So metal, with any other 
element, right? And remember, metals cannot bind with metals. Always metals and non-metals. Metals are always going to be the positive, and the non-metal is always going to be the negative charge. But I see a metal, so case yellow 4 is going to be an ionic compound. Now we just got to figure out what the ions are. Now, whenever we have a certain compound, just know that this compound will always break into two ions. Never three, never four, it's always two ions. So you have to basically, in this case, fill three different atoms into two boxes. When you have more atoms than you have boxes, chances are one of them is going to be a polyatomic ion. So you got to figure out which one it is. Now, K is the metal, so that's going to be by itself. The split is here. That means that ClO or ClO4 has to be in the other um, box which means that this is the polyatomic ion. So let's first search for that. ClO4 is right here, perchlorate. Perchlorate is always ClO4 with a minus one charge. Oh, and we found out what the charge was, ClO4 minus one. Now we just got to figure out what K's charge is. K is in group one, and group one's always a plus one charge. So that's the charge for this. And those are the ions that were needed in order to create this compound. So we would say K plus one came together with ClO minus one. And those are your two ions. A is done. Now let's erase and let's set up for B. So B is Mg C2H3O2. Okay, well, I see Mg, that's magnesium, and magnesium is right here. Okay, well, this is a metal, so right off the bat, this is a metal, so it's another ionic compound. But now we got to figure out what the ions are. Well, this whole compound's got to fit, and it's got to break down into two boxes, right? What were the two ions that came together? Well, the metal is always going to be by itself. So the break is going to be here. Mg is in one ion box. And then this whole thing has to fit in the other box. What does that mean, guys? This is probably a polyatomic ion. So that would go in the other one. So C2H3O2. All right, so let's figure out what C2H3O2 is. Now, if we scan our polyatomic chart, I won't see specifically C2H3O2, but I will see something else. Look at this right here, CH3COO. If I took CH3COO and I grouped it together, how many carbons are here? Oh, there's two carbons, right? So that's C2. How many hydrogens? Well, okay, there's three hydrogens, so H3. And then how many oxygens? One, two. So this is O2. Oh, this looks like the same thing that's over here. So just know that these are exactly the same. They're acetate. And the first one would be a minus one charge, and the second one is a minus one charge. So that's how I know that this is acetate. It's a minus one charge. Now we just got to find out the charge for magnesium. Now, magnesium is right here. It's in group two. So that means that magnesium should be a plus two charge. Now, I just want to say, uh, just for the record, that I think that there's a typo in this one. It should be Mg and then parentheses C2H3O2 2. That would be the only way that you can guess correctly what magnesium's charge is. So I just think that there's a a little bit of a typo on their part that you'll probably see in the textbook. There should have been a parenthesis here and with a two there to get these charges. Magnesium would be no other charge. So that's how I know that there probably would be a typo because you wouldn't be able to get this compound if you were following the rules that they want you to follow. So this is Mg2 plus and then acetate C2H3O2 minus one. Check that one off. We are moving on to the next one. And the next one is 
H2S. So we first got to figure out where hydrogen is, and then we got to figure out where sulfur is. Well, hydrogen is over here, and sulfur is over here. They're both nonmetals. There's two nonmetals. So no metals here. They're all nonmetals. So actually, C would be a covalent compound. And for covalent ones, we don't have to write the ions because there are no ions involved. They share electrons. Next, Ag2S. All right, well, I'll write this one down. Ag2S. Where is Ag, which is silver, and where is sulfur? Well, sulfur is here. It's a nonmetal. And Ag is over here. Oh, okay. So there's automatically a metal, right? Ag silver is a metal. So this has to be a ionic compound. All right. Well, we know now that we have one compound and this has to split into two different boxes with the two different ions. Well, here we only have two elements, right? We have uh, silver and we have sulfur. So the split basically is right here. Ag came together with sulfur, but we need to know the charges. Well, what's sulfur's charge? Sulfur is here, and it's in a main group element. Sulfur is going to be a negative 2 charge. So I know that sulfur would be a minus 2 or a 2 minus. But now what would be the charge of silver? Uh-oh. Silver is over here. There's no charge up here. So this is where we do the, basically you crisscross back up to get the charges. In the last example, in number 97, we crisscross down. I showed you an example where we crisscross down. Here we're going to crisscross back up to find the charges. So how we do that is we take the subscripts and there was two AGs, so we will take two. And how many sulfurs were there? There is one here. So these um, subscripts will crisscross back up to tell you the charges. The two crisscrosses to sulfur, telling you that there should be a negative two charge. And just for um, simplicity's sake, usually the positive will always be in the front, majority of the time, like 99%. This one crisscrosses up to tell me that Ag was a plus one charge. So do you see how this matched? Sulfur was a negative two, and there it was here. Ag has to be a plus one charge, and that's how you find that one out. So sometimes you can use the periodic table for your charges like we did in sulfur, but other times you're going to have to crisscross it back up to find out for your transition metals. So this would be Ag plus one coming in with a sulfur ion, which is a two minus, and that's the end of that. Next, we got N2Cl4. Where is nitrogen and where is chlorine? Well, nitrogen is here. It's a nonmetal. And chlorine is here. It's also a nonmetal. We got two nonmetals. So automatically, this is a covalent compound. No Ions are necessary because they do not form ions. They share electrons, so that's that. Last one, CONO32. CONO32. CO is cobalt. That sounds like a metal, but let's just be certain. Cobalt is right here. It is a metal, right? This is cobalt. So this is automatically going to be an ionic compound. Now we just got to find those atoms. Well, the ions, right? So I have one whole compound and needs to fit into two boxes when it breaks down, right? What are going to be the two ions? Well, the metal is always going to be by itself. So here's the end of the metal. So I know that I have cobalt. And now I have more than one atom. I have NO3 that I have to fit into this box. This two. I don't write in here because that too just tells me how many I had of them. But the ion itself is NO3. This is a polyatomic ion. So I have to go to my chart. Remember, the charges for polyatomics will never change. So if you guys just memorize what NO3's charge is, it will always be that charge. Now let's go find it. NO3 
is right here. It's nitrate, right? NO3. And there's the charge. It's a minus one. So we know that NO3 is a minus one charge. And now let's see. What about cobalt's charge? Well, cobalt's right here. Uh-oh. There's no trend for the oxidation state for cobalt because it's not a main group element. It's a transition. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to crisscross back up. Now, before I wrote all over this, let's just do this over here. There is CONO32. There was one cobalt. That's the subscript. That's how many cobalts there were. There was one of them. And there's two nitrates. And remember, the nitrate is NO3. So there's one cobalt, two nitrate, and those are the numbers that get crisscrossed back up. This one crisscrossed to tell me that NO3 was a minus one. And look at that. It was a minus one charge. So now all we got to do is crisscross the two. This two crisscrosses to cobalt, telling me that it's a plus two. The pluses always go in the front. And there you go. That's the charge of cobalt. So cobalt would be a plus two alongside NO3 minus one. And that would be the second part of this answer. And it doesn't matter whether you say two plus or plus two. It doesn't really matter. But there you go. Those are your two ions. And that's the end of this problem. All right. So there's a lot of stuff that we got to memorize. Know how to use your oxidation state trends. Memorize the polyatomics. Know how to find metals, metalloids, and nonmetals on the periodic table. And keep practicing your crisscross, um, you know, if you have to crisscross back up to find the charges. And probably in the next chapter, definitely in the next chapter, we will crisscross back down to find the compounds. All right? I actually think that we're going to do that in the next question. So if you want to stick around and if you're on the playlist, we'll do that one together. All right? So thank you so much for coming here. If you wouldn't mind, click the subscribe button. Just helps us get the channel out. Um, and click the like button too if this helped you out. All right? Thank you so much for tuning in. See you guys all in the next question. Bye-bye.